It's great to be here with you tonight. Thank you for joining us uh, for this topic of calling, which is in some respects uh, one of the top two issues that the church perennially has to address. And the first one being dating, sex, and marriage, and the second one being questions of calling. Uh, this is for the New Yorker, the, the quintessential questions of life. I mean, all of your whole life is really around those two particular topics. And thankfully, I don't have to address uh, dating, sex, and marriage. And I get, I think, a little slightly easier topic of, of calling. Um, and calling is something, I think, that is mysterious for a lot of people and something that often goes unchecked. Uh, when, we, when I think about my own life, in the la two years ago, I went through a pretty significant life transition to a new role with new responsibilities. On top of that, I had my first child. And th the first year, as many of you guys who have been through this road will attest to, it's just a blur. You don't remember any of it. And this second year, as I kind of rise out of the thick cloud, I begin to have these, these larger questions. I feel disoriented. I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do. And I realized that these existential feelings I was going through, these are questions of calling. And in some ways, my old paradigm of calling was continuing to guide me in a new stage of my life, a new season, and that the fact that I hadn't updated or thought about calling in my new stage really created some real tensions for me. And this topic, for that reason, has been, uh, I've taken a particular interest in really digging deeply into what does the Bible say about what calling entails and how we discern it. When we think about our, our broader culture, and when you equate this idea of calling to your career, uh, our culture arises out of this quest for authenticity. And this has been a long philosophical tradition uh, that goes back to Rousseau and Locke of individualism and, and the focus on kind of finding this self. And let me just read to you um, a quote from Charles Taylor, a philosopher, I think that crystallizes this sense of how our larger culture is trying to discern this sense of, of career. Charles Taylor writes this in his uh, book, The Ex Ethics of Authenticity. Being true to myself means being true to my own originality, and that is something only I can articulate and discover. In articulating it, I am also defining myself. I am realizing a, pot a potential potentiality that is properly my own. This is the background and understanding to the modern ideal of authenticity and to the goals of self-fulfillment or self-realization in which it is usually couched. And what Charles Taylor is trying to say there is that our quest for calling and vocation, if we're kind of drinking um, the air of the culture around us, points us back to our own selves. It's looking within ourselves to get a sense of who are we? What is it that we really want? What are my gifts? What are my passions? And oftentimes the, the discerning process to figure out what you're called to do in life is almost synonymous with a self-discovery process. But as Charles Taylor in his book will argue, uh, when authenticity is grounded in this self, it's a self-defeating proposition, meaning the more you try to find your authentic self in yourself, you will find yourself more lost and confused. And I think that's where a lot of us are. Whether you're a Christian or not, we're confused because somehow we still consider calling in the light of our larger cultural understanding of calling. And what that ends up happening, uh, creating is this sense of uh, disorientation and discontentment. William Platcher, in his book, Callings, which I think is one of the best books on this topic, uh, he writes this, We accumulate worldly recognition and material goods, but they leave us unsatisfied. The stories of our lives come to seamless, seem, the stories of our lives come to seem pointless if they are not part of some larger story. And so it is that we search for what God is calling us to do. And in that quote, there is what I would consider a radical shift from what the larger culture is moving towards with respect to calling. It's a call to say your authenticity, your sense of calling cannot be grounded in yourself but rather it has to come external to yourself. And in the case of Scripture, it has to come from God himself. It has to come from that larger narrative. That becomes the anchor by which we can evaluate this sense of authenticity as well as meaning. And you need to question yourself at this point, how do I discern my sense of vocation and calling? What metrics do I use in my own mind to figure out if I should take path A or path B? Do I become a nonprofit 
Well, it's kind of like, do you work for um, Teach for America or Goldman Sachs? That kind of dichotomy, you know? Um, and there have been countless articles in the Times just about that question alone. But let me begin by saying the biblical understanding of calling begins first and foremost with the caller and not the calling. That in order to discern your call, you first have to be able to discern the caller. And so the Bible from the very language of calling begins from a very different a starting point, which is there is a caller external to yourself that you need to be able to hear and discern. Now, I want to move quickly to uh, Scripture because I want to just show you, in many respects, um, the biblical notion of call spans a whole spectrum of concepts. But I want to try to highlight a few biblical passages under a few categories. And then secondly, I want to synthesize all those passages. And then thirdly, talk about how that leads us to inc uh, growing in our discernment of call. Okay, so starting off with biblical principles or biblical um, passages, then the synthesis of those passages and how those passages allow us to uh, grow in our discernment of calling. The first point here I want to point out is, um, well, let me go to that slide that you saw. Uh, wait, do I have control now? Okay, here you go. So... If you were to do a kind of biblical search on this topic of calling or the Greek and Hebrew equivalents, uh, you would see that there are literally thousands of hits. It is uh, throughout all the pages of Scripture. And where I want to start off with as we approach this idea of the biblical passages around this topic is really with Genesis 1 and creation. That we have a God from the very first page of Scripture who calls, who speaks. And when he speaks, there is a creative power to his voice. And what we'll see as the narrative goes on, that creative power continues even after the fall in a redemptive or recreative power. And so calling for us is very much associated with what we see in Genesis 1 and how that turns in the fall, that responding to God's call is inherently redemptive in nature. It's inherently recreative. And so in our minds, already, uh, from the very beginning, we begin to have these kind of anchors in the understanding of call. Now what I'm going to do is fast forward quite significantly, and um, I was debating or not, debating whether or not I should lead you through a lot of these passages to kind of lead you inductively to uh, these two categories that I'm just going to spell out for you now. But as you look at all the passages of Scripture, uh, this idea of call fall, falls into two kind of main categories, and the Puritans really kind of use these categories. The first one was called the general call. And the general call was really about God's call to you for salvation, it was his voice calling out, calling those to respond to the grace that came in Christ. And so passages like the ones you see are just a small sampling of this larger category of the general call. Let me just read this to you, uh, these passages to you. Uh, 1 Peter 1.15, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Again, he who called you. And this is with reference to uh, your salvation. Romans 8.30, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Uh, 2 Peter 1.10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and your election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Here in this passage, Paul is using synonymously this idea of calling and election. In Galatians 1.6, Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. There, Paul says very explicitly, the call is to the gospel of Christ. And then later on in the same book, uh, Galatians 1.15 but when he who has set, up, set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace. Again there, this idea of calls being connected to being chosen even before he was born into the gospel. And so that constitutes the primary, the first bucket of calling, being called to the gospel and to respond to that gospel in faith and obedience. The second bucket is what, again, the Puritans would call the particular call. And this is about how the call of God res, um, corresponds to the particulars of our day-to-day -day lives. Let me share three passages with reference to uh, this aspect of particular call. Exodus 31, 2 through 6. This is an Old Testament passage. 
See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with abilities and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanships to, to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. I think that's a very clear passage in the Old Testament that correlates God's call to particular gifts that he endows to people for the sake of, uh, of doing particular tasks. In this case, the construction of the temple. Uh, I'm sorry, the tabernacle. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.17 only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. In this passage, Paul is referring to, again, the particularities of how God's call works out in the details of our day-to-day -day lives. And 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12, you see something even clearer. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our, uh, of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In that passage we see here in the bold, worthy of the calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith. How that works out in the particulars of the work that we do. Now, I remember when I was being taught this in seminary, it was very helpful to have these large buckets. So when you thought about uh, the nature of your call, it was kind of this this general call that you receive to be a Christian, and then this particular call that works out in the details of your life. And when it came to hearing and responding to that general call, that first category, that was Christian discipleship. It was faith and obedience. It was going to church, reading scripture. It's the kinds of things that we associate with kind of traditional Christian life. But then there was this kind of mysterious second category, the particular call in which there was employed a different set of metrics, in a matter of speaking, to discern call. It was uh, concepts of wisdom, your abilities, your gifts, um, opportunities. And they almost seem to be two discrete different kinds of callings. One that's much more personal with respect to your eternal life and salvation, and the other one that seemed much more mundane uh, and how it spoke to kind of how you should go about discerning your vocational decisions. Now, the question that I have in mind is, how do these things come together? Is there an intersection between the general and the particular call? Because that was a question that I never asked when I was learning these concepts, but as I've been struggling with it in my own life, trying to figure out, okay, where, am, where is God calling me to be faithful right now? The intersection became very interesting. And you'll see in the next verse here, um, something that illuminates the way that these things inter intersect with each other. Uh, Ephesians 4.1, Paul writes this. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It's an interesting um, sentence. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And in this passage, Paul is doing something that we see elsewhere in the New Testament. He's bringing together the general and the particular call in such a way that's emphasizing that these things are always meant to go together. They're never meant to be two discrete buckets in which you're trying to discern, okay, what does it mean to be a Christian? And then what does it mean for me to be out working day to day? That these things are meant to be worked out together. Another way of saying that is um, that the general of who we are in Christ has to be worked out in what we do. So let me paraphrase Paul's statement here, sentence. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of who you are in Christ to which you have been called in what you do every day. And it's really this integrated calling that I think presents a very unique gospel-centered approach to calling. A lot of times when we're trying to discern calling, you can, in some ways, have the gospel be very secondary or peripheral to those questions, and then you begin to employ common sense, kind of the gifts that you have. And I think there's a tremendous um, hunger and thirst 
for kind of life coaches and executive coaches to really help you do this using kind of metrics that make a lot of sense. And I think they can be extremely useful. But in the context of the Christian notion of calling, the gospel really has to be at the center of both who we are and what we do. And those things have to inform each other. Another way of saying this is sometimes uh, when we think about our lives as Christians, we focus so much on who we are in Christ. What does it mean to be a child of God and to live ethically and morally, to love the people the way that we think that we ought to? But then when it comes to what we do, that second category of the particular calling, we kind of read you know, the best books that are out there. You read kind of blogs about vocation careers and you kind of use your common sense. And then there are people who kind of invert it as well. Um, there are those who just kind of focus on uh, what is God calling me to do and in some ways go to the extreme of uh, desiring a mystical experience where God is literally just with a megaphone telling you, I want you to be an investment banker, right? And then you hear, I heard the voice. Now I know what to do with my life. How many of you guys have heard that voice? Okay. I hope. Well, you might have. But all that to say, that's another extreme where what, who we are is critical for us in the discernment of how the particulars work out. And it's really this, this intersection that I would call properly Christian calling. It's not one without the other. And as we dive deeper in the synthesis here, when we begin with this question, who we are in Christ, it's interesting that Jesus, when he answers um, his disciples, you know, what does it mean to follow you? He, his first response is, you have to deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow you, and follow me. Not follow you. That would be going back to the authentic age here. And the very beginning point of calling, which begins with who we are in Christ, begins a radical disconnect from our larger culture. It's not about what is it that you're passionate about. It's not about what is it that you're really gifted or good at. But Jesus begins with this question. Are you willing to deny yourself and die to yourself to follow me? In another passage, uh, Jesus says this, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his, sake for his life for my sake will find it. And it's passages like this that really should haunt us with respect to this idea of discerning our vocational careers. That Christ in almost from the very beginning says, do you believe who I am? That the starting point of discerning Christian call is really going back to the fundamentals of our faith and asking ourselves the question, am I willing to follow Christ? Do I believe that he rose from the dead? Am I willing to stand with him even in the face of discomfort and perhaps ridicule? These fundamental questions that allowed the church to grow in the first few centuries and calling for the, first, uh, for the Christ Christians in the first few centuries was really all about that question. Am I willing to deny myself and pick up the cross to follow God? And I think it is no less true for them or for us as it was for them. Now that's a hard pill to swallow, I know, for many of us. And that's a, a question that we really have to wrestle with. But you can understand the logic here of, of why we need to begin there because at some level, if we are not willing to submit ourselves to the lead of God, it doesn't matter what you end up doing in the particulars of every day, right? It doesn't matter if you end up into some elevated position or a position uh, that really uh, utilizes the gifts and the skills you have. If you don't have a receptive ear towards God in obedience and faith, the particulars don't matter all that much. And God has to cultivate in us first that heart disposition that looks at him with such awe and gratitude and the joy that comes for what he's done allows us to respond in this radical self-denial and a desire to de die to our own selves for the sake of following him. Now, 
when that reality becomes clearer in our lives, it allows us then to see kind of the second part, which is in the, the particulars. And I want to use, uh, put, bring up 2 Corinthians 9, 8 here. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in good work. And in the context of this passage, Paul is addressing some financial hardships, some very real day-to-day -day issues uh, that a lot of people around the world face every day. But he's now talking to people who have made the decision to follow Christ, who have accepted the general call, and now how the particulars work out. You look at the counsel that Paul is giving to them, and he's saying, the grace of God will give you everything you need for every good work. And what should stand out to you as you read through this passage is the comprehensive nature of this promise. He's not saying only the things that refer to your spiritual life will work out. The particulars of your day-to-day, -day, that's really up to you and your hard work. No, Paul is making very clear that what happens every day the particulars of your day are as dependent upon the grace of God as your eternal salvation. And he's saying that understanding has to guide the ways that we think about our particular call. Do you believe that grace is as critical in the advancement of what you do every day as much as it is critical to this, this sense of our eternal salvation? Other passages that help us um, remind us of these, how these buckets uh, overlap of the general and the particular, uh, one that I want to highlight in the general is just the truth that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. That when you think about your general call, the Bible continues to remind us that we are new creatures. The old has gone, the new has come. This is a truth, this is a gospel reality that has to be reinforced over and over again so that we can correctly appropriate what God is calling us to do in the particulars. And again, in the particular, Scripture reminds us in Colossians 1, 19 through 20, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his Christ. Uh, of, the, of his cross. And in this passage, Paul is highlighting the nature of how the gospel is reconciling all things, both in heaven and earth. And that includes the things that we do day in and day out. That's something here at CFW we're really passionate about, helping people understand that God is redeeming all things, including the industries and the sectors that you are, all are associated with. And this passage reminds us again that God's purposes in redemption both include the individual as well as the whole creation that we are a part of. Now let me go to our, my, the final section here. And then how does this synthesis help us discern this idea of calling day to day? When you have these, the integration of these buckets... It has to work out not in the big questions of what do I do with my life or who should I marry or who should I date or where should I move? Should I stay in the city? Should I go? That calling is first about how that integrates in the day-to-day, -day, how that integrates tomorrow, about thinking about your day and the interactions you have, the work that you do. Does the gospel meaningfully come to bear in what you do day-to-day? I want to give an, uh, two examples of this. Um, when I was in undergrad, uh, I took this, um, one of my elective courses uh, was a filler course, something that uh, was, I thought would be an easy course, but it ended up being quite difficult. It was the music appreciation class, right? Uh, and I thought this would be a breeze and, you know, this would give me a break from uh, doing a little bit more work. And you know, the final was basically we had to listen to Gustav Holtz's The Planets. And some of you may know that work. It's uh, as seven movements. It goes through all the planets, and it's just kind of magisterial work. And the, the assignment at the end, the final, was we're going to play you snippets of this, um, this work, and you're going to have to identify it. And I remember thinking to myself, how in the world? I mean, this is hours, hours of, um, of, of wonderful classical music. <laughs> 
And I was just listening to bits and pieces, just completely dumbfounded. I'm like, I can't do this. And the teacher advised just to break it up and listen to a little bit every day and just keep listening. And uh, I took her advice because I had no other alternative. And so every day I would listen to a different movement, go through different planets. And sure enough, as the days went on, and I had the final, and she played the pieces, I was thankfully able to discern what pieces, uh, what movements they were a part of. But it was the cultivation day in and day out of listening to the differences of, from movement to movement that allowed me to take a little snippet here and then be able to identify, yes, that's Jupiter, that's Saturn. I think the same is true for when we think about discerning God's call. If you're not used to hearing God in the day-to-day and he's speaking to you, there is no sense that we can discern whether that's coming from God or our own selves. Is it coming from my own desire for self-glory or is it coming out of a desire to really glorify God? And it's really in the day-to-day that we cultivate the ears to hear. Otherwise, we're just so numb and deaf to God's voice because there are so many competing voices in our lives, the largest being our own. But the practice of daily dying to self, living in faith and obedience in the small things allows the gospel to become much clearer and the voice of God to become clear in our lives. Let me give you a concrete example of how this might work in the workplace. So I know, uh, you know, this is a new year, and some, some of us are going through performance reviews at work, you know, the dreaded sitting in front of your manager, and you're hearing kind of the report, and they hey, try to say all these nice things up front, and then they give you the critical stuff at the end. Um, and you're sitting there, and you're thinking, what are they going to say? And as soon as they, you hear that one critical piece, what's the typical response? Right? We respond very defensively. And you ask yourself, why? Because what's being evaluated is not simply my job performance. What at the heart level, it's about your identity. It's about your security. It's about your worth. And all of a sudden, something that should literally just be about whether or not you get a couple more dollars or maybe a lot more dollars becomes something much bigger. And the, the, why is that? Because the gospel hasn't been appropriated in that moment. That functionally speaking, what still drives you is the sense that my accomplishments shapes my sense of identity, value, worth, security, comfort. And in that moment, if we begin to live out this call, we ask God, who am I again? And he reminds us in that moment, you are my son, you are my child. Your security is in not the hands of your employer or which company you work for, but your security, your status is all completely found in Christ. And that is a security and a status that you could never accomplish on your own, far exceeds anything that we could accomplish in our own works here in this world. And when the Spirit of God begins to confirm that to you, that your work is not your identity, the value of who you are is not found in the performance you bring into your workplace. When the Spirit of God begins to minister those gospel truths, in that moment you are discerning God's call and you are then able to respond appropriately in the particulars of that moment. In the way that you respond to your manager and you say, you know what, I really appreciate that. I know initially when I heard that I just wanted to respond a little bit out of anger and uh, self-justification, but I think you're right. And I appreciate the fact that you're willing to um, be very honest with me. And to pre- be able to present yourself that authentically and that transparently, but in a way that is grateful and recognizes that this is not all who you are, is potentially a very powerful testimony in our world today here in New York City. That's just one example of things that happen throughout the day where without realizing it, our hearts are so grounded in our own self, improving who we are, improving our worth and our security, grounded in our own abilities. And of the thousand times that we do that, we just need to hear a little bit more every day how God is calling us to live out the reality of the gospel in the particulars of that moment. And the way that we grow in that, oftentimes it's not in the actual moment, but in retrospect, in reflection and meditation, And when scriptures call us to meditate, it's not just simply asking us to think about God in this abstract theoretical way, but it's asking us to think about God in relation to how your day went today, in relation to the the conversations you had with people, 
in relation to the kind of work that you did and the disposition of your heart. So every day presents a tremendous opportunity for us to grow in our calling. And over time, the aggregation of each day in small ways, responding to God in faith and obedience, gives us the ability to discern those larger decisions that we have to make that often we put a lot of weight upon and we have no ability to really answer that because we haven't cultivated this, uh, this gift of discerning God's voice.